Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the course of verification webinar. My name is Jane Hoopy, and I'm the Deputy Director of Environment at the Air Transfer Bureau of ICAO. I'm very pleased to have so many course of focal points joining the webinar today from all around the world, especially during this difficult time. I also welcome the observers from the International Accreditation Forum, IAF, joining the webinar today. Taking this opportunity to speak to you directly, I hope you and your loved ones are all safe and healthy. The ICAO Secretariat has been working tirelessly to listen to the needs of member states and provide all necessary support in implementing Corsia. In that regard, it has recently been brought to our attention that some member states are facing difficulty in interpreting the provisions related to third-party verification under the Annex 16, Volume 4, and the recommendations provided in the Environmental Technical Manual, Volume 4, in particular with regards to site visits during the verification activity. Today's webinar is organized to minimize any confusion and provide clarity to all course and focal points on this matter. I hope this webinar provides you the opportunity to affirm your understanding and address any question or ambiguity you may have on this matter so that you can report the agreed 2019 CO2 emissions by the 31st August 2020 deadline as prescribed in the Annex 16, Volume 4. Furthermore, I would like to share with you wonderful news on this specific topic that has been agreed just last week. So, the Working Group 4 of the Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection, CAPE, the technical expert group that works on Corsia for those who are not familiar with CAPE, has agreed to develop guidance, text uh, for states on remote verification, and also another guidance for verification bodies on remote verification to be prepared in the near future, hopefully by the end of next month. The Secretariat will share the guidance as they, they are prepared and uh, inform all course of focal points as appropriate. In addition, I would like to share with you that the ICAO Council is also discussing the impact of COVID-19 on aviation, including the course implementation. If there is any decision by the Council on the course implementation in any aspects of course implementation, all course focal points will be notified accordingly, so rest assured. I would like to conclude my opening remarks by reaffirming our commitment, even during these difficult times. Secretariat remains at your disposal to support all course of focal points. With this, please allow me to end these remarks, wishing you all a fruitful webinar. I would like then uh, to hand over to Manuel to start the presentation. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hugh. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to everyone. My name is Manuel Caballero, and I am one of the environment officers in the ICAO Secretariat working on Corsia related matters. I am very happy to see so many of you today, albeit in an all night mode, and I hope that uh, you are all doing well. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Before we get into the substance of today's webinar, let me share a few housekeeping rules in order to get the most out of our time today. Please mute your microphones during the presentation in order to avoid the background noise that may make it difficult to follow the, the discussion. If you have any questions or comments, please use the chat function on the right hand side, clicking on the speech bubble icon. When, when you do so, please send your message to everyone, not only to the presenter or the organizer, because otherwise it may not be possible to address your comments. The Secretariat will address questions registered through the chat at the end of the presentation, to the extent possible given the available time. But prior to that, as you know, you had the opportunity of submitting your questions on this subject um, to, the, to the Secretariat. So those questions that have been submitted prior to the webinar and the related answers have been included in the second part of the presentation and will be addressed before looking into the questions in the chat. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is the purpose of today's webinar? The objective is to provide clarifications to you in your capacity of Corsia Focal Points on Corsia verification rules and guidance, in particular on the subject of site visits, taking into account the peculiarities of the current situation. In doing so, it is very important to keep in mind that we are going to clarify what is said on this matter in two documents. We have on the one hand Annex 16, Volume 4, containing standards and recommended practices for course implementation. And we also have Volume 4 of the Environmental Technical Manual containing guidance on how to implement the SARPs contained in Annex 16, Volume 4. Therefore, this webinar is not going to provide information or guidance which is new, additional, or different from what's already contained in these two reference documents. So please keep this scope of the webinar clear in mind when providing your questions and comments. The slide also shows the agenda for the webinar. First, we are going to provide an introduction on how verification works in the context of Corsia including its fundamentals, the process to be undertaken by verification bodies, and how verification bodies are accredited for Corsia purposes. After that, we will cover a questions and answer session, and we will wrap up reflecting on the key, the key takeaway messages on this webinar. So just one more reminder to please mute your microphones if you still have them unmuted so that we avoid the background noise. Thank you. So with this, we can go to the next slide, please. All right, so let's start now with the fundamentals of how verification works in Corsia. The illustration on the screen presents the annual MRV cycle in Corsia. As we all know, the first step that has already been undertaken is that um, the emissions monitoring plan prepared by the European operators serves as the basis for the annual monitoring of CO2 emissions by the operator. So, as I said, it is the operator who prepares the emissions monitoring plan in close coordination uh, with the corresponding um, uh, civil aviation um, authority of the state to which the operator is attributed. And it is the state that approves this emissions monitoring plan. After this, the annual MRV cycle as such starts with a series of actions that have to be repeated on an annual basis. So in a given year, the operator will monitor its CO2 emissions in accordance with what is included in the approved emissions monitoring plan. Then the operator will compile the so-called annual emissions report. So in the case of the 2019 CO2 emissions data, what operators have done at the beginning of this year is to prepare the corresponding emissions report. Once the emissions report is ready, then the operator can engage a verification body for the verification of the annual emissions report. The verified emissions report, together with the corresponding verification report, are then submitted to the state by both the aeroplane operator and the verification body. So the state is then requested to conduct a so-called order of magnitude check 
for each of the emissions reports received from the various operators attributed to the state. The state will then prepare the aggregated information for all operators attributed to it and will submit that aggregated information to ICAO. So, in a nutshell, these are the annual ML MRV actions that have to be undertaken uh, under Corsia. The focus of today's webinar will be on what is uh, uh, surrounded by the uh, red line. Uh, so we will be focusing on the verification aspects of the annual cycle, specifically the third party uh, Corsia verification. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the verification activities in Corsia ensure that the monitoring of CO2 emission takes place according to the approved emissions monitoring plan as established in NS16 volume 4. And also that the reported emissions are correct and reliable and are supported by documentation and reports. When we say that the emissions are correct and reliable, we mean that they are free from material misstatements and material non-conformities. In this regard, the verification procedures should allow the verification body to make a conclusion on the following items. First, that the aeroplane operator CO2 emissions assertion is an accurate representation of emissions over the period covered by the emissions report and is supported by sufficient and appropriate evidence. Second, that the aeroplane operator has monitored, calculated and reported its CO2 emissions over the period of the emissions report in accordance with NS16 volume 4 and the approved emissions monitoring plan. And third, that the aeroplane operator has correctly applied the method of flight attribution documented in the approved emissions monitoring plan and in accordance with NS16 volume 4 to ensure, for example, the correct attribution of leased aeroplane and international flights operated by other aeroplane operators under the same corporate structure. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, how does the process of verification of the operator's emissions report start? The aeroplane operator is requested as per AMA 16 volume 4 to engage an accredited verification body for the verification of its annual emissions report. This verification body is the third party needed for this purpose. The operator may engage a verification body accredited in another state, provided that the state to which the aeroplane operator is attributed allows for such an arrangement. The verification body should conduct the verification according to the ISO standard 14064-3-2006 and the course specific requirements described in Appendix 6 of NS16 Volume 4, as well as guidance in ETM Volume 4. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's now move to see how the verification process of the emissions report corresponding to the 2019 CO2 emissions works. Next slide, please. Thank you. According to ETM Volume 4, Section 3.3.4, the verification process for the emissions report under Corsia can be broken down into 10 steps involving three key participants. We have the verification body, we have the aeroplane operator and the state. The majority of the actions have to be undertaken, obviously, by the verification body in coordination with the aeroplane operator. So, before the aeroplane operator um, engages the verification body for the verification of its emissions report, the operator is uh, advised to conduct an internal pre-verification of its emissions report in order to improve data quality and the underlying data gathering process. So this is represented in the figure by the gray rectangle on the top right corner. The verification process itself is represented by the 10 steps listed on the left-hand side of the slide. So this process has to be conducted by the verification body in close cooperation with the aeroplane operator. These 10 steps lead up to the submission of a final verification report to the state after receiving authorization by the aeroplane operator to do so. In the case of the emissions report covering the 2019 uh, CO2 emissions, as we all know, the deadline 
to submit the verified emissions report to the state is 31st of May 2020. So, following submission of the emissions report and the related verification report to the state, the state will conduct an order of magnitude check in accordance with the timeline as defined in Annex 16, Volume 4, Appendix 1. This is represented as the three rectangle on the bottom right. So this is in a nutshell how the, the verification process uh, of the 2019 uh, uh, or the emission reports for the 2019 CO2 emissions works. We can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in the following slides, we are going to go through a brief explanation of the verification process to be undertaken by our verification body. This process will be divided into three phases. The first phase is the preparation for the verification phase. The second phase is the verification activities per se. And the third phase is the submission of the verified emissions report and related verification report. So now here we are going to focus on the first phase, that is the preparation of the verification, which covers steps one to four shown here, as well as the voluntary preliminary verification by the aeroplane operator. This is the phase where the verification team is formed and the scope and complexity of the verification activities are analyzed through strategic analysis with the data and information provided by the aeroplane operator, including the pre-verification result. Again, these are uh, steps that have to be undertaken by the verification body. Potential risks to the verification activity are also assessed, more specifically on step three in the diagram, which is the so-called risk analysis. Among the factors to take into account here, one sees, for example, the complexity of the emissions monitoring plan based on the number of aeroplane types, different monitoring methods, whether simplified MRV with a Geocorsia service used, etc. Important inputs to analyze potential risks to the verification activity include the maturity of the internal control activities and data flow activities. For example, whether the operator has a certified management system in place how fuel data is collected and tracked, etc. Based on this result of the risk analysis, a verification plan will be drawn. This is what uh, is shown in step four. This will include a series of elements, such as, for example, the verification program, detailing the verification objective, verification scope, arrangements and responsibilities within the verification team, site visit arrangements, if needed, activities performed on and off-site, list of documents considered, and so on. The verification plan prepared by the verification body will also include a test plan for control activities, which will detail the scope and methods of testing procedures described in the operator's emissions monitoring plan, IT controls, quality assurance in outsourced processes, etc. Last but not least, the verification plan will also include a data sampling plan that will cover scope and methods, identification of specific data points such as ACAR triggers, flight logs, fuel uplift statements, etc. In other words, this phase is a particularly important phase with regards to the matter of site visits, which is one of the main interests of this webinar. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in this slide, we reflect on one of the issues that are currently of most concern regarding verification in Corsia. It's important to note that Annex 16, Volume 4, has no mandatory requirement for site visits to be conducted as part of the third-party verification. However, ETM Volume 4, the guidance on how to implement Annex 16, Volume 4, describes site visits as an essential part of the verification activities, as it helps the verification team in collecting sufficient and appropriate evidence to confirm whether the emissions report is free from material misstatements and material non-conformities. So here, the term site refers to the place where the operator performs the main activities of data processing to calculate the final figures as included in the emissions report. So that site can be, for example, the headquarters of the aeroplane operator. So the verification team of the verification body should determine 
based on the result of the risk analysis, we have seen that in the previous slide, as well as based on any evidence obtained during the pre-verification by the European operator, whether there is a need to conduct site visits, and if so, what is the scope, duration, and number of site visits needed. In case of limited risks identified in the risk analysis um, stage, ETM Volume 4 proposes that alternate verification techniques may be used to substitute the site visits, and those have to be coordinated and guided by the state and its national accreditation body. Therefore, as Corsia focal points, it is highly advisable for you to identify and coordinate closely with the national accreditation body in your state to ensure that the appropriate guidance is provided to aeroplane operators in your state and to the verification bodies they are working with. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we are now going to move to the second uh, phase of the verification process, uh, which is, as we said, the verification activities per se. So the verification activities start when the aeroplane operator provides its emissions report to the verification body uh, to be verified. It's important to note that in the previous stage, the aeroplane operator has already shared um, information with the verification body, but that may not necessarily be the complete emissions report. But definitely the latest the operator has to share the emissions report with the verification body is at this point in time. The verification body will reassess the status of the emissions monitoring plan, the aeroplane operator's information systems and controls related to greenhouse gases and associated CO2 emissions data and information. The verification body will check if the emissions report is in compliance with the emissions monitoring plan, the one approved by the state, and whether the emissions monitoring plan, of course, is in compliance with the SARPs in NS16 Volume 4. So, at the end of the verification activity, the verification body will choose between two types of verification or statements, either verified as satisfactory or verified as non-satisfactory. If the emissions report does not include material misstatements and or material non-conformities, then the verification body will uh, label the emissions report as verified as satisfactory. If the emissions report includes uh, misstatements or uh, non-conformities of a non-material nature, then the emissions report will be verified as satisfactory with comments. And here the verification body will have to clearly specify the misstatements and, and non-conformities uh, and will also have to confirm that these are non-material. Finally, if the emissions report contained material misstatements or material non-conformities or both, or if the scope of the verification is too limited, or if the verification body is not able to obtain sufficient confidence in the data, then the emissions report will be labeled as verified, as not satisfactory. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, the final phase of the verification process is the submission of the emissions report and the related verification report to the state. So here, both the operator and the verification body are requested to send both reports so that the state will receive two copies of each document. Once a state receives the verified emissions report and the corresponding verification report, it will conduct what we have called an order of magnitude check. Uh, in accordance with Annex 16 Volume 4 and with the guidance for order of magnitude checks provided in ETM Volume 4. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now we are going to look into how verification bodies can be accredited to perform verification services under POSIA. Next slide, please. Thank you. Annex 16 Volume 4 says that a verification body shall be accredited by a national accreditation body in order to be eligible to verify emissions reports in POSIA. The verification body will have to be accredited under the standard ISO 14065 version 2013 
greenhouse gases requirements for greenhouse gas validation and verification paths for use in accreditation or other forms of recognition. In addition, the verification body will also have to be accredited for the course specific requirements as described in ANE 16, Volume 4, Appendix 6. So, ANE 16, Volume 4 also says that a national accreditation body should be working in accordance with the standard ISO IEC 17011 on conformity assessment, general requirements for accreditation bodies, accrediting conformity assessment bodies. Here, it is important to highlight that as of 30th of April 2020, 40 verification bodies are accredited for CORSIA purposes in 17 states. And the information on accredited verification bodies for CORSIA purposes can be found in the IKEA document CORSIA Central Registry, CCPR, Information and Data for Transparency, which, as all of you know, is available in the IKEA CORSIA website. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, regarding the accreditation of verification bodies for CORSIA purposes, a key step during the accreditation process is the so-called witness audit. So, ETM Volume 4 establishes that the witness audit allows the national accreditation body to monitor the verification approach taken by the witness verification body during an actual audit. Here, it is important to note that given the short period of time available for national accreditation bodies to schedule witness audits and finalize the accreditation process, some national accreditation bodies have provisionally accredited the verification body on the premise that site visits by the verification body will count as witness audit. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now that we have covered how the verification process works for the verification of operators emissions reports in Corsia. Now we are going to move to the second segment of this webinar where we are going to address questions that have been submitted by participants prior to the webinar. So as I said at the beginning of the presentation, we are going to go through those questions and related answers and um, after that we will uh, address any questions or comments that may have been submitted uh, in the chat. But first we are going to um, focus on those that uh, have been kindly submitted by, by you in the days prior to this webinar. Next slide, please. So, the first question that we compiled asks if the voluntary pre-verification substitutes or replaces the third-party verification. So, the answer to this question is no. The voluntary pre-verification by the operator does not replace the third-party verification by the verification pattern, but is rather a complementary and recommended step to it. The voluntary pre-verification is not a requirement as per Annex 16, Volume 4, but European operators are recommended to consider preparing for the third-party verification process by conducting a pre-verification. More information can be found in the Corsia Frequently Asked Questions, more specifically in question number 3.83. Just to note here, as many of you know, that the Corsia Frequently Asked Questions are available in the Keo Corsia website, in the web link at the bottom of this slide and next slides, as you can see. So, the second question on this slide asks whether third-party verification is a requirement under an F16 Volume 4? The answer to this question is yes. The third-party verification is indeed a requirement under Annex 16 Volume 4. More specifically, the reference in, in the Annex is paragraph 2.4.1.1 of Part 2, Chapter 2, where it is stated that the aeroplane operator shall engage a verification body for the verification of its annual emissions report. So, third-party verification is an integral part of uh, the activities under Corsia. Yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, question number three asks if a third-party verification is needed when the operator has estimated the annual CO2 emissions 
using the IKEA policy as certain? The answer to this question is yes. So according to Annex 16, Volume 4, an airplane operator should engage a third-party verification body for the verification of its annual emissions report, also when the IKEA policy as certain has been used for generating that emissions report. Again, I would like to refer to the information in the course of frequently asked questions, more specifically the one related to question 3.84. Question number four on this slide asks if there is any exception to third-party verification requirement due to the current situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The answer to this question is, so far, no. The ICAO Council is currently assessing the impacts of COVID-19 on course implementation. And as Ms. Hughes said at the beginning in the opening remarks, any decisions that may affect the provisions of Annex 16 Volume 4 will be communicated to all ICAO states in due course. But this is the situation as things stand today. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, question number five asks if a site visit is a requirement for the verification process as per Annex 16, Volume 4. As we have seen in the first segment of the presentation, the answer to this question is no, site visits are not a requirement under Annex 16, Volume 4. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that ETM Volume 4 more specifically, section 3.3.4 recommends site visits to take place as an essential means for the verification team to collect sufficient and appropriate evidence to confirm whether an emissions report is free from material misstatements and material non-conformities. So what ETM Volume 4 says is that whether site visits take place or not is dependent on the result of the risk analysis conducted by the verification body prior to the verification activities per se. ETM Volume 4 provides flexibility to replace a site visit with an equivalent approach when the verification risk is determined to be low by the verification body in the risk analysis and also recommends to clearly mention in the, in the verification report whether site visits have been replaced and the reasoning for this decision. So, as we said before, the verification body should coordinate with the state to which the aeroplane operator is attributed before replacing the site visits with an alternative approach. Next slide, please. Thank you. So question number six asks, how can verification bodies conduct site visits given the current situation? Uh, with the existing travel restrictions and before submitting the verified emissions report by 31st of May 2020. Well, given the restrictions and measures imposed in several states due to the COVID-19 situation, national accreditation bodies, in close coordination with the civil aviation authorities, may provide guidance to their verification bodies on whether a remote assessment would be accepted as a measure to address the current situation. Some states have taken such an approach and have provided their accredited verification bodies with guidance on this matter. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, question number seven here asks if there is any requirement for a verification body to be accredited by the national accreditation body of the state where the verification body is registered. According to Annex 16, Volume 4, um, more specifically, uh, Paragraph 4.4.2 of Part 2, Chapter 4, a verification body shall be accredited to ISO 14065, version 2013, and the relevant requirements in Appendix 6, Section, section 2, by a national accreditation body. So additional requirements or conditions for national accreditation bodies to accredit verification bodies, including the accreditation of a foreign verification body, are within the purview of the national accreditation body of each state. So here we would like to refer to the note 
under paragraph 2.4 and 2.1 in AMI 16, volume 4, part 2, chapter 2, that says that an aeroplane operator may engage a verification body accredited in another state, subject to rules and regulations affecting the provision of verification services in the state to which the aeroplane operator is attributed. That means that Annex 16, Volume 4 does not set any constraint in this regard, but of course, at the same time, acknowledges that um, uh, different states may have specific regulation in this uh, matter. So, question number eight in this slide asks if a verification body can be accredited by several national accreditation bodies. The answer to this question is yes, a verification body, if so, if, if so wishes, can seek accreditation by national accreditation bodies in more than uh, one state. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, Question number nine submitted by Porsche uh, Focal Points before this webinar asks if a civil aviation authority can accredit verification bodies. The answer to this question is no. According to Annex 16, Volume 4, uh, Part 2, Chapter 2, Paragraph 2.4.2, accreditation has to be granted by a national accreditation body which works in, in accordance with the ISO IEC standard 17011 on conformity assessment, general requirements for accreditation bodies, accrediting conformity assessment bodies. In another state. The list of accredited verification bodies um, of Corsia is included, as we said before, in the key document, Corsia Central Registry, CCR, Information and Data for Transparency, which is available in the key Corsia website, more specifically in the web page detailed in the, in the slide. For further information on this uh, matter, please check ETN Volume 4, um, chapter 3, sections, section 3.3.2.3, as well as the uh, questions 394 to 396 of the Corsia frequently asked questions in the IKEA Corsia website. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, we should now move to slide 24. Okay, thank you very much. So question number 10 asks if an aeroplane operator should submit a copy of the accreditation certificate of the verification body that has verified the emissions report together with the emissions report when submitting to the states? The answer to this question is no. Um, according to Annex 16, Volume 4, there is no such requirement for aeroplane operators to submit a copy of the accreditation certificate to the states. Of course, providing such information would provide assurance to the state that the operator has engaged an accredited verification body. But this is also something that can be done by checking the IKEA document with a list of accredited verification bodies. Question number 11 asks what a state can do to check the accreditation status of verification bodies referred in the emissions report. According to the checklist for the state order of magnitude check, as contained in Table 3.9 of ETM Volume 4, Question 62 of that table says that the state is encouraged to check that the verification body is included in the IKEA document containing the list of accredited, accredited verification bodies. So if the verification body referred in the emissions report is not included in the list, then in principle, the emissions report does not meet the requirements of any 16 volume four. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, 
Question number 12 asks if the order of magnitude checked by states requires specific training or if it is enough to follow the ETM checklist. Well, the answer to this question is that the order of magnitude checked by states does not require special training. Um, ample guidance has been provided in ETM Volume 4 in order to facilitate this uh, task to be undertaken by the state authority. So I will refer again to Table 3.9 of ETM Volume 4 with a list of uh, questions or checks that the state uh, can do in order to complete this order of magnitude check. I would also like to refer to the fact that the Secretariat included materials on this specific matter in the materials presented in the 2019 Corsia Regional Workshops, which can be found in the IKEA Corsia website, more specifically in the web link or in the slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Question number 13 asks if there is a training on Corsia verification. The answer to this question is yes. IKEO has launched a Corsia verification course, both in an in-person and in virtual classroom modalities. Uh, the purpose of this course is, uh, well, to address verification bodies, which are interested in performing verification activities in Corsia, and provide training to them on how to verify CO2 emissions reports that have been prepared by aeroplane operators in accordance with the provisions in ANS 16, uh, Volume 4. More information about the course, including uh, upcoming sessions, can be found in the IKEA website. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, before moving to um, the key uh, takeaways, uh, and before uh, also uh, looking into um, uh, questions that have been submitted during the presentation in, in the chat function. Um, I would like to give the floor uh, to Ms. Hugh because this key takeaways uh, slide uh, should be perhaps the last slide that we cover uh, today in the webinar. Um, so uh, I would like to give the floor back to, to Ms. Hugh. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. You're always very precise, very clear on your uh, presentations. That was very good. Thank you. So, um, as you have seen, uh, question and answers uh, were requested to be sent in advance, and we have included them uh, during uh, this presentation already to make sure that we could uh, listen to all your uh, questions and prepare the answers accordingly, um, even before uh, today. But um, let me say something else. Um, there, there were a lot of references in the questions that you asked to the frequent asked questions, the FAQ, that we have already in our website. It takes a lot of work, guys, to keep this uh, frequent asked questions updated. Please use it. It's for you. So you have at the bottom of the, the page that you see in front of you right now, that's the site of the frequent asked questions. Um, a lot of your doubts, they have been doubts by someone before, or we, we we have thought that, that we could explain a little bit more specifically. So all those questions have been um, duly registered there in the frequent asked questions. As a focal point, the, the first resource that one would have, apart from the, the, the annex and the manual, is this frequent asked question. So I really, really fully encourage you before asking anybody else, to go to the frequent asked questions. Um, you'll see that uh, there is a lot of questions there. There's a lot of effort to already address those questions. You might have not been the first person asking that question. 
So please take a look at the frequent asked questions. Um, we have noticed that many questions are coming in our direction. We have already answered on the website. So it's quicker, it's more efficient if first you take a look at the frequent asked questions and then you come to us. That said, um, all the questions that we have received now that we see that have not been contemplated in that frequent asked questions, we'll do the ultimate effort to now update those questions and um, include those uh, new questions there as well for completeness. Something else I wanted to tell you is that this uh, presentation today has been recorded. I noted that uh, some of you came a little bit later than um, the beginning of the, the presentation and that had that possibly has uh, impacted your understanding from the very beginning. So if you want to see it again and, or if at any point you have another doubt that you want to see what was really the what was again the explanation of that part or you want to do a refresh, please just you know, ask Manuel to address the questions muted so during this call time permitting but i thought that before we would do that we could uh, profit that we have so many uh, focal points uh, with us today and see if we can share some good practices regarding this um, uh, remote verification so if there is uh, focal points on this call whose state have decided to go for the, the uh, that the state allowed for this uh, remote verification and they already have uh, some um, knowledge and some experience in doing so if they want to share that with the other focal points in the call uh, we would be happy uh, to get your testimonial on, on, on that experience and share it with the others so I will just open the floor if uh, any focal points from our states would like to uh, share that uh, experience with the other focal points. Uh, hello, I yes. would like to share our experience from Japan. May I? Okay, please do. Uh, please, please, please. Go ahead. Okay, um, in Japan, some operators uh, especially use overseas verifiers requested us to allow remote verification. So as a special measure only this year, uh, we accept it uh, only under the condition that quality of remote verification is equivalent to on-site verification. And as, me as mentioned in ETM, uh, we will request risk analysis by verifiers and we will validate result of risk analysis before the remote verification and of course uh, before we announced this policy to operators uh, we had made guidance and coordinated with national accreditation body and verifiers and we discussed uh, how to ensure the same quality as on-site verification Thank you. Japan, thank you immensely for sharing um, that experience. I'll still open for other focal points if they see, um, if they could share their experience. And uh, Manuel, after I'll just ask you to talk a little bit more on the guidance that uh, Kate is uh, developing uh, that we will be also uh, bringing to the, the attention of the, the focal points. Is there any other space? Okay, we have uh, in the chat the US. Uh, then, uh, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, hi, Jane. Good morning. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, so, this is uh, FAA had actually not really given much thought to this or given much planning to it. Um, we were actually prompted by our uh, national accreditation body ANSI to give some guidance to them because the issue had actually had arisen that their verifiers were trying to contact operators and the operators were basically saying we can't 
we can't travel to you and we frankly don't want you traveling here, you know, because this is the sort of start of the pandemic season. And so we uh, sat down with um, our uh, accreditation body and sort of figured out what was going to be a reasonable way forward. I think the challenges that I would note in sort of coming to a decision, um, and we actually have guidance I can, um, I can forward uh, Manuel uh, Stelios, you all, and the, and the secretary office. I'll, I, I can forward you the email that we that we sent out that our accreditation body sent out. But basically, we sat down with them and tried to decide what was the, you know, the the principal focus has to be on the health and safety of everyone. And with that in mind, what is the what is the best way to go about getting the data we need? most effectively verified, recognizing that it may not be perfect as a result, but you can let perfection slip a little bit if you're talking about keeping people safe and healthy. Um, and so we sort of left it to the discretion of the individual verifiers to determine whether or not they could carry out a site visit. And if they were unable to carry out a site visit, giving some explanation and some reasoning, some documentation as to why they weren't able to. Um, and I'll, I'll, Jane, I'll send you guys that email so you can forward it around if you want. Oh, thank you so much, guys. This has been extremely, extremely uh, helpful. I see as well that we have Mahed from uh, UAE. Jane, do you want to also give your testimony on um, remote verification, is that? Hi, Jane, how are you? Yeah, Hi. this is Majid. Go ahead. Uh, so basically, uh, here in UAE, we have been engaging with our uh, various operators and stakeholders here and encourage them to uh, keep up a speed on reporting their uh, emissions and as well to the verifiers. Yet we have discussed a lot of challenges related to the availability of the verifier here within our state, uh, which unfortunately we have uh, none. Therefore, we uh, encouraged our operators to go and find the uh, suitable verifiers uh, around. Then uh, due to the unfortunate pandemic situation, uh, some of the operators have uh, done the remote verifications uh, over here. And we are at the moment facilitating all of that and supporting them whenever it comes to anything. Yet the big questions or some of the questions which we are receiving uh, related to the submission and whether there is a chance of postponing it or something, this is still under discussion, but definitely IK will be the one who will provide us with the right lead on that one. Uh, thank you very much for everyone and thank you for the webinar. Thank you, Mashad. Um, uh, we have addressed this issue of the, the deadline and, uh, you know, uh, the internal deadline of uh, between the state and the operator due to the COVID, it's something that the operator and the state have to discuss. The important deadline for us uh, will be at the end, the 31st of August, when the state can use the, the CCR to report to IQ. And that's a future they still will hope that we will put in place all the, the necessary support to you so that we can uh, address that. Uh, properly. So, Manuel, at that point, I do not see uh, any other state uh, calling for um, Jane, sharing their verification. Jane, remote, but, Jane? Um, yes? Yes, this is Rashid from Qatar. Yes, uh, go ahead. Yes, yes I, I just want to add our uh, few words about our experience here with, uh, with our uh, airlines. Please do. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we have requests from some of them to discuss the possibility of postponing the deadline of the 31st of, of May, and we are still in discussion about that. And for one of the cases, we have a request to use a remote um, verification process, and we, after discussion, we agreed to that based on uh, the fact that this small airline has a few aircrafts and they are using the uh, the ICAO uh, tool 
for their uh, for their emission reports and we have assessed that there is no that uh, big risk using a remote uh, remote verification process taking into account that there is a process uh, that has been uh, prepared to do this remote verification then it's it's uh, it, it depends on the airlines and their 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 processes for the emission reports and verification process and the decisions will be taken accordingly in our in our CAA excellent thank you thank you Rashid. Uh, you see we can uh, see that many uh, countries and many states uh, are now looking into that uh, possibility and i would like now to pass to manuel uh, so that he manuel can you comment a little bit on the guidance that uh, is coming and um i think then after if we could look at the uh, questions that we have uh, received if they were not yet covered in the presentations we if we have uh, the time to to do so we should thank you and thank you all for your testimonials i think um you know there are the rules there are the procedures but it's very reassuring to see those recent procedures being put in practice now uh, um, uh, and um, the result of doing so and uh, the experience i think uh, it's inspiring for other uh, states and focal points as well so manuel the floor is yours uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, as discussed, uh, the first thing that um, I will comment on is uh, what Ms. Hube said in the in the opening remarks uh, regarding the the guidance uh, uh, to be developed by uh, CAEP and its working group four on Corsia uh, on the specific uh, aspects of remote verification. Um, and and here. Um, uh, well, this is something really uh, new because Working Group 4 had its uh, third meeting last week. It, it finished last Friday. Uh, it was a very um, successful meeting despite the challenges of conducting it in a remote modality. And, and one of the aspects that was uh, discussed uh, in the meeting was uh, precisely is that given the, the current uh, situation and given uh, well, the many questions uh, surrounding uh, the issue of remote verification versus on-site verification, uh, well, the group uh, agreed to develop additional guidance to what's already reflected in uh, ETM uh, Volume 4 on, on this aspect. And this guidance will be uh, twofold. So on the one hand, um, the objective is uh, to develop guidance that will help states, so state authorities, to evaluate uh, whether a remote uh, verification approach can be accepted when an airplane operator and the verification body the operator is working with present this uh, or propose this as a, as a way forward. And the second uh, item that will be addressed by this guidance to be developed uh, will be uh, addressed specifically to verification bodies on further guidance on how to conduct remote verification in this specific uh, setting of uh, Corsia and the uh, verification of aeroplane operators emissions reports. So again, um, uh, CAEP and its working group four is uh, fully aware of the importance of uh, and, and the necessity of, of uh, this this guidance uh, so it's uh, the group is uh, working uh, with a very tight uh, deadline uh, but we are um, well uh, hoping to have uh, the, the guidance developed uh, soon um, it is difficult uh, when we are working in such a, a short uh, notice to say exactly when uh, but what uh, has to be said for sure is that once uh, Working Group 4 uh, concludes its work on the guidance and that is uh, endorsed by the group as a whole and, and shared with uh, with CAEP for its um, agreement, then that guidance will be uh, quickly made available uh, to the public 
uh, firstly through uh, the frequently asked questions section of the IKEO policy website, but uh, for sure we will also um, inform our policy focal points uh, on, on, on this and direct them to, to where in the frequently asked questions this new guidance um, is available. So again, uh, this is something that uh, we can we can expect uh, soon. So uh, now, uh, following the flow of the of the webinar, um, while uh, we were uh, hearing uh, about the experiences uh, or approaches that are being followed by. Uh, some uh, of the states on this matter and, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank those who have taken the floor for sharing their, their experiences with, with all of us. Uh, I, I have been uh, uh, looking into the uh, different questions that have been uh, posted uh, in, in the chat. Uh, we will try to cover uh, them all um actually some of them can easily be grouped because uh, the, there is this recurring uh, question about the possibility of extending uh, the the deadlines that are currently reflected in annex 16 volume 4 for the reporting uh, from operators to states and from uh, states to um, ICAO and in this regard uh, again, we have seen this um, uh, actually covered in uh, the presentation, uh, more specifically in question uh, four, but uh, we will we will uh, refer to it once again. Uh, that what we have now in this regard is uh, the standards in Annex 16, Volume 4, where those deadlines are detailed and the guidance uh, in ATM volume four on how to implement the standard. So, of course, uh, we are informally uh, uh, hearing uh, about uh, some states that are taking some action at a domestic level in order to, uh, let's say, release a bit the pressure of uh, the reporting from the operator side to uh, the states. But here, what we have to keep in mind is that uh, the important uh, deadline, uh, let's say, is the 31st of August 2020, uh, which is the deadline when states will need to uh, report aggregated uh, results from their aeroplane operators uh, to ICAO. So, um, at this point in time, um, it, it is not, uh, let's say, a, a matter of talking about uh, possible extensions uh, of of the of the deadline because uh, th that is definitely not uh, a decision that is in the hands uh, of the secretariat. This is uh, what the secretariat's role is is here uh, to help states uh, to, to 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 do their best to meet the established deadline. So, uh, for example, uh, this webinar is just one of the many activities that we are doing in in that regard but you are also aware of the online training that uh, has been undertaken on the Corsia Central Registry, which is about to be um, released. We have also referred to the verification training uh, developed in cooperation with ICAO's global aviation uh, training. We also have, of course, we need to refer to the many activities that even in the current circumstances are uh, going on under the ACT Corsia program, where we have uh, the, the kind contribution of a number of states uh, with their expertise supporting their uh, body uh, partners, Corsia bodies, um, uh, in, in um, let's say, making sure that all the steps needed for the implementation of Corsia and the states are taken. So, um, again, if um, there were a decision uh, along the lines of uh, an amendment of a, a deadline, etc. That is definitely a, a decision that would need to be uh, undertaken uh, taken by uh, by the council, and uh, of course, uh, our role then as secretariat would be to inform immediately of such a decision um, uh, to member states. So uh, this, this is, uh, let's say, this covers. Uh, all the questions that we have received in, in the chat regarding the extensions of, of, the, of the timeline. Uh, so, um, another 
a set of questions deal with the specificities of verification bodies, whether they can be um, uh, engaged by um, an European operator after, uh, um, depending on uh, a series of different circumstances. Uh, so, uh, one question is what happens uh, if um, a verification body is not included in the ICAO document that lists the accredited verification bodies for course purposes. And here, uh, again, we have addressed this in, in, in a question in the second segment of the, of the webinar. But uh, here we would like to reiterate uh, the point that at the end of the day, it is in everybody's interest that if a verification body has been accredited by a national accreditation body for course purposes, that that information makes its way to the ICAO document that lists the accredited verification bodies. So, uh, and we also have to keep in mind that the states have the possibility of submitting updates to uh, the accredited verification bodies in the uh, that the ICAO document that contains the list of accredited verification bodies keeps on being uh, updated. So, um, I would find it odd if a verification body that has taken all the steps and has been accredited by a national accreditation body uh, it would be odd if ICAO has not been informed by the state of such a, an instance. So again, as we said, and uh, sticking to the wording in Annex 16, Volume 4, um, the verification body that the operator works with has to be included in, in the ICAO document because that will be uh, uh, an assurance that the verification body has been accredited and that the state has informed uh, ICAO accordingly. So let me uh, look at other questions that are not related to the issue of timelines, which has already been covered, or the issue of verification bodies not included in the list. There is a question on uh, what happens if uh, the verification body levels um, an emissions report as not satisfactory. Well, that definitely uh, sends a red light to the state. As we know, the state, when they compile the verified emissions reports from the different operators in the state, have to do some aggregation before submitting the information to, to ICAO. Obviously, if one of the emissions reports received by the state has been labeled as not satisfactory, the state cannot just proceed in the same manner as with the emissions reports that have been received um, uh, and, and labeled as satisfactory. So obviously this is a matter that has to be sorted out mainly between the operator and um, the verification body. Of course, they are the ones uh, who have uh, let's say, the, the deepest knowledge on the reasons why uh, such uh, a qualification has been provided to the emissions report. And of course, it is also advisable that in the process of looking into and investigating the reasons why uh, this has happened, of course, um, uh, operators and verification bodies are encouraged to also keep um, the a state authority engaged and informed uh, and at some point even uh, the state authority may be in a situation to provide advice on how to sort whatever the situation is that has triggered this non-satisfactory uh, qualification. But again, the, 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 main, the main point here is uh, that for the state, well, obviously they cannot bring that emissions report on board together with uh, satisfactory uh, emissions reports and, and that uh, it is mainly a problem that has to be sorted out and solved by the verification body and, and the European operator. Let's see. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, we have many questions around the issue of timelines. We have many questions around the issue of 
uh, verification, but it's not in the list. Okay, there is a question. Uh, okay. Mm, there is a question on the aggregation of data in the missions report at either aerodrome pair or state pair. Um, uh, here it is important to keep in mind that an existing volume four, an ETM volume four, allow both levels of aggregation. So there is not like a, a top one uh, preference and second best. Both levels of aggregation at state pair or aerodrome, aerodrome pair level um, are allowed. And here it is the state that has to make the decision on which level of aggregation the state wants the operators to report on. Um, and, and well, this decision, uh, again, taking into account that there is no preference as per the annex material, then it can be based uh, perhaps on uh, the way the information uh, is uh, collected and, and available, uh, or it can be perhaps based on, uh, well, uh, the uh, information systems the state already has in place, which uh, perhaps even prior to Corsia were already in place and consider one level of aggregation rather than the other. But the important thing here for the state is A, that there is no preference on the level of aggregation, they can go for one or the other, and two, that it is the state's decision to choose one of the two and then inform the operators in the state about that decision so that all the operators follow, uh, let's say, a, a, a harmonized approach in, in this regard. Okay, um, so there is another question on the minimum percentage of sampling flights when uh, the verification is done. Well, this is definitely, I would say, a decision that has to be made by the verification body. Uh, we have seen in the presentation that during the preliminary steps that are taken uh, prior to the verification per se, the verification body in close coordination with the operator and with the information that the operator can already share with the verification body gets a picture of the situation and that is fundamental for uh, the verification body to define a number of parameters on how the verification body is going to conduct the verification and the sampling percentage is definitely one, one of them. So it is uh, definitely something, it is a, a decision that corresponds uh, to uh, the verification body. And of course, uh, I can imagine that depending on the situation that applies to different operators, uh, then the verification body may, may make different uh, decisions in, in this regard. Okay, let me see uh, what else. Um, okay, there is a question on the risk assessment. We have referred to the risk assessment uh, a few times in, in the presentation. And there is a question on whether there is any, any guidance on how to conduct it. Well, the, the, the first important thing is to remember that the risk assessment, conducting the risk assessment is a task to be undertaken by the verification body. So it is a verification body task. Um, and in this regard, um, uh, risk assessment is referred to um, in ETM volume four, which provides the uh, guidance on, on how to implement the standards in ANS 16 volume four. So um, ETM volume four has a specific uh, guidance on that, but we also have to take into account that a verification body accredited for Corsia purposes is accredited for the specific and relevant ISO standard. So obviously um, uh, it is presumed that the verification body, if it is accredited, has already uh, a knowledge on how to conduct uh, a, a risk uh, assessment. Uh, but of course, uh, the ETM volume four can be helpful for the verification bodies to uh, deal with the aviation specific or course specific uh, aspects of the verification. 
Okay, and also here uh, we saw uh, a, a comment from uh, Mr. Faklan from IAF that also uh, refers to um, uh, remote audits uh, being covered in uh, documents of IAF and there is guidance that would be very useful for verification bodies on, on that. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for that contribution. Um, Okay, there is a, a question on financial problems being faced by um, operators that may make it difficult uh, to uh, arrange uh, the uh, contractual payments with the verification body. Well, this is this is indeed uh, a, a difficult situation that may be uh, affecting. Uh, a number uh, of operators, not only on Corsia specific matters, but also on, on other uh, aspects related to the operators uh, uh, functioning. Uh, and, and in this regard, unfortunately, uh, well, it, it is uh, very difficult for 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 uh, the care secretariat to provide uh, specific uh, guidance on, on on this issue. Um, okay, what else do we have here? Uh, there is a question on uh, items that uh, may be discussed by uh, the IKEO Council in its uh, next session in, in June. And as Ms. Hupi said, any decision that the Council made which is relevant to the implementation of Corsia, we will immediately inform uh, Corsia Focal Points of, of uh, such a decision if, if such a decision takes place. Um, Okay, the other issue, last question I have here is uh, related to the basis for the calculation of the so-called Corsia baseline um, and uh, the specific reference to the uh, particularities of the 2020 uh, data. Here, uh, well, you will, you will excuse me for uh, sticking to the scope of this presentation, which is specifically on um, verification-related matters on, on Corsia. And uh, again, here, any decision be made in, in this regard. Uh, of course, it is our task to inform um, Corsia focal points uh, should a decision be made in this regard. So I, I don't see further, yeah, there is more questions. Give me a second. Um, Okay, uh, there is a question of whether there is uh, specific um, questions in the course of frequently asked questions addressing the COVID-19 situation. Um, thank you for that question. I think that today, no, there is no uh, such thing. You know, this is a situation that is evolving uh, very quickly. The Secretariat has taken very quick action to respond to the increased uh, uh, needs and demands from states, uh, and I listed before all the actions that we have taken. Uh, this course webinar on verification being just one of them. Um, and and um, again, I would also like to refer to the uh, very good uh, work uh, undertaken by CAEP's working group for last week and the decision to develop uh, guidance on the specific matter of uh, remote verification. Uh, focus on, on the one hand, states, and on the other hand, um, verification bodies. Well, that, uh, the moment it is ready and available, as I said, will be posted in the uh, frequently asked questions. So you can expect that in the same manner as we have done in the past, the frequently asked questions is a leading document that keeps on being updated, and, and perhaps that guidance uh, will be uh, if not the first, one of the first items uh, on this topic that will be included in the frequently asked questions. So now I, I believe that we have covered uh, most of the questions. Uh, apologies if I haven't referred specifically to uh, one of them, but uh, as, as you could see, because uh, the chat is open to everyone, many of them could be grouped in basically two questions, the issue of the possible extension of the deadline and the issue of how to treat verification values that are not included in the IKEO document that lists the accredited verification bodies. Uh, but I hope that we have covered 
um, all uh, your questions together with the ones that were kindly submitted by you before the webinar. So we are 10 minutes away from the end of the uh, webinar. So um, yeah. uh, perhaps it is a good idea if we now uh, wrap up the webinar with these key takeaways that we can take uh, from it and that are uh, shown uh, on the screen. So um, I think that we are um, in slide 27. Yeah. So let, let's go ahead with the summary of the key takeaways from this uh, webinar as presented in the slide. So first, uh, we have seen that verification is one of the key components of Corsia to safeguard the quality of the reported information and data. And here it's important to stress the importance of third party verification, meaning we need operators need to engage an accredited verification body, which will act as that third party that will conduct the verification. Second key takeaway is that site visits are not a mandatory requirement as per Annex 16, Volume 4, but are recommended as an essential element of the verification. And uh, here uh, we highlighted the importance of the results of the risk analysis undertaken by the verification body in order to ascertain whether um, uh, on-site visits are required or remote verification is uh, possible. Third uh, key message that we want to convey is that Corsia focal points are encouraged to coordinate with the national accreditation body in your respective states to provide guidance to accredited verification bodies with regards to site visits and possible flexibility due to COVID-19. So here we have to make a distinction between two things. The current ongoing arrangements that states may be undertaking at a domestic level in order to facilitate the reporting task uh, from the operators to state and with the state always keeping in mind the state's reporting deadline to ICAO of 31st of August 2020 and then uh, complementary to this of course we have referred to the guidance uh, that will be shared by the CAO Secretariat as undertaken by CAEPS Working Group 4 on the issue on remote verification. And fourth, as we have uh, repeated uh, uh, throughout the presentation, any decision that the Council takes that may affect the provisions of the standards in Annex 16 Volume 4 uh, due to the COVID-19 ongoing situation will be communicated to all uh, ICAO states uh, in due course. So, thank you. No, no, thank, thank you. you so much. I, I just wanted to, to say a few words. I think uh, um, we have to thank all of you. We have around 120 uh, people in this call. Um, so many uh, of the focal points were present. So it, to me, it shows all the interest and all the willingness for all the focal points to, to do their work properly and according to what is requested by um, and agreed in the, the SARS by all states. Um, I hope that the, this webinar was useful to all of you. Um, I think we have reached uh, the intent, which was to clarify uh, uh, this issue on verification um, again. Uh, we received a few um, um, calls uh, that were saying, oh, because of the mandatory nature of the verification in loco and because we cannot do, so I think we have clarified that this is not a requirement in the SARPs, but is something that um, is uh, recommended in the ETM. Please note that that's not the uh, only activity in ICAO where we have equivalent procedures that are put in place. Uh, those that uh, amongst you that also work on certification, you know that we have uh, equivalent procedures that we use, that we are flexible about even on the certification of aircraft. That's not something new in the ICAO environment. So, but we did not want uh, neither operators to come to say we cannot do because it's of this issue when it is a recommendation, not uh, SARPs, 
and it depends on the situation of each state. That's not uh, a problem uh, to all states. Um, again, I think, and I would like to reinforce what Manuel said on our support. Our course is here to complement all the training that the Secretariat has been given. We, if you're a focal point, you know that we, as we, we start this remote arrangements for working and we could not ourselves go to train you uh, in your state, we immediately put in place an alternative to do so. And we did not uh, cease to fulfill our commitment to you in the training of the CCR and others um, due to the, the COVID. And that's our commitment to you in moving forward. We have heard some comments about uh, the financial situation, etc. Of course, it's not uh, what will lead an airline to bankruptcy or not, but we are fully mindful of the, the uh, financial situation and maybe you should look into maybe this flexibility that is given uh, for the verification is, is even in the sense of uh, some financial relief as well. Uh, you have to talk to it, your operators, you have to talk to the accreditation uh, bodies, and I think it's up to each state to um, do their best. We are here to support again. Um, something else we, we want to say that you'll be contacted by your Act Corsia uh, buddy, um, and we are trying to help you through this Act Corsia as well. So we will try to bring this guidance that Manuel referred to also through the Act Corsia. Everything that we uh, talked about today will be placed on the web, the recording of this entire session, the presentation, and the update of the frequent um, questions and answers. Please note that um, the verifiers, they are professional, professionals trained to do their job. The situation that's happening with aviation on their inventories, let's say, is not unique. Every single activity has to do uh, a check of their emissions as well. And um, those verifiers, they are professionals on there. The accreditation bodies are fully aware of the situation. The issue here is if we have flexible um, uh, procedures that, as, that are as robust as doing the site visit we can do that and have the very good and robust result. So we wanted to reassure you on the steps and what can be done. And we are here to help you to move forward and implement uh, Corsia as uh, we need to, to do. Those are emissions from 2019. Um, so from the end of last year, uh, this has been compiling, uh, 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 operators have been compiling their emissions to send to you. You have done a tremendous job preparing the authorities to do the job. You are ready to go for it. And if we can help you in any um, shape or form, please let us know. Okay, so with that, I think I only want to thank you all uh, for your presence, for your contributions, for your interest, for a very, very interesting uh, testimonials and questions. I think this was a very good and participative uh, session. And if you need anything else from Secretariat, do not hesitate. That's the source of information you should have. Anything else that's been said out there, please um, come back to us and ask the question to, to us. We'll be happy to clarify, okay? And with that, I would like to finalize this uh, uh, webinar. Thanking immensely for Manuel for a tremendous job in explaining very carefully with transparency, with, uh, you know, there was a lot of clarity on what he said. I, I hope that that has been of use to you. Thank you so much and please keep safe. Thank you. <laughs>